Welcome to Week to Week, the political roundtable from the Commonwealth Club of California, and thank you for joining us for our special post-election roundup. I'm John Zipperer, your host for Week to Week, and the Commonwealth Club's Vice President of Media and Editorial. We hope you are staying safe and well wherever you are, and we look forward to seeing you in person someday in the future at the Commonwealth Club's headquarters in San Francisco. Until that happens, we are doing all of our programming online. This is just the latest in nearly 300 online programs the club has produced in the past seven months. You can find all of our upcoming programs, as well as audio and video from our past events, and how you can support the programming that we do at commonwealthclub.org. Now, if you're watching us live on YouTube, use the chat function there to post questions for our panel, and we'll try to work some of them into our conversation today. On today's program, we are, of course, going to talk about the results, some known, some still yet to be confirmed, uh, of yesterday's uh, national election, uh, as well as local state issues, from the White House to Congress to propositions and more. It has been a white knuckle, stressful night for people on both sides of the political divide. I think a lot of us wanted a really quick and definitive calling of the presidential election, but instead it actually went much more like a lot of analysts were telling us to expect. Close races, slow counting of mail-in ballots. Dan Rather said, quote, we awaken to a country in pain, deeply divided, and in search of its soul, unquote. But maybe Jimmy Kimmel spoke for most Americans when he said, this is like being awake during your own surgery. So let's get started and meet our panelists for today. Carson Bruno is joining us from Southern California, where he's Senior Director of Training and Programs for Coro Southern California. You can follow him on Twitter at Carson J.F. Bruno. Hello again, Carson. Hello. Marisa Lagos is a politics correspondent for KQED News and the co-host of the Political Breakdown podcast. You can find her on Twitter at M. Lagos. Hello, Marisa. Hey, John. Good to see you. And Dan Schnur is a professor of political communications at, I have to take a breath before I list all of these, UC Berkeley's Institute of Governmental Studies, Pepperdine University's Graduate School of Public Policy, and the University of Southern California's Annenberg School of Communications. That's literally all of the political communication professorships in the state, so <laughs> he's got them all wrapped up. He's also the founder of the USC LA Times Statewide Political Poll and host of the Politics in the Time of Coronavirus podcast. And you can follow him on Twitter at Dan Schnur. Hello again, Dan. Don, thanks for having me, and thanks for wading through that introduction. I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, that used up most of our time today, so we're going to make <laughs> this really quick. I will well, say... You know, Dan's going to put himself out of a job with that uh, podcast, though. So he'll, he'll have one less title, hopefully, in, in 2021, right? <laughs> the way things are going, that coronavirus might last long enough to... Uh... <laughs> Okay, well, let's let's get right into this. We do have a lot to cover, and let's start right at the top with the presidency. As of right now, the election is still uncalled. Uh, final counting continues in a number of battleground states. Marisa, I want to start with you. What do we know as of now and about the count and the potential victor? Yeah, so um, Wisconsin in just the last hour was called for Biden. Um, the Trump campaign is asking for a recount, but I think uh, that was a call made, obviously, by independent analysts, analysts not the Biden campaign. Um, and I think that it looks, that was the way things were trending. Um, I would say all eyes now are really on Michigan um, and Arizona and Nevada. If Biden pulls out those three states, he doesn't actually need Pennsylvania, which is obviously the subject of much later vote counts and a lot of, um, you know, concern over the potential for litigation. Um, so I will just note in that scenario, what actually would put Biden over the edge is Omaha, Nebraska, that one congressional district in Nebraska, um, which is kind of insane. Um, and also speaks to, you know, we saw Trump actually go there in the final days of the campaign because they saw that math. And so, um, I don't know, it's interesting to me, we've kind of come full circle a year ago, we were all saying Wisconsin would be the deciding factor. And it, it you know, I mean, you can say any of those are, but it may well be that Wisconsin is kind of that canary in the coal mine that, um, if, if Biden can do those other states. Dan, which, are, which states and which trends are you watching right now on the presidential race? Dan, you're on, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Well, John, like you, I am a proud cheesehead. And so I too watch the state of Wisconsin. And I'll note uh, two things. Um, both the Wisconsin Badgers football game this Saturday has been canceled because of the virus. And it now appears that the Packers Niners game for tomorrow night might be in some danger also. 
Wow. Um, but switching back to switching back to politics for a moment, Maurice is exactly right. But I'll add just one twist on this: uh, Wisconsin state law actually um, uh, requires a recount, if I'm not mistaken, if the margin is close enough, and uh, and and if the margin is not quite as close as all that, if it's less than one percent margin, the defeated candidate has the legal right to call for a recount. So even though the race has been called by neutral observers, not by the Biden campaign, uh, the Trump campaign does have it within the right to challenge a recount. And what makes that a little bit more frustrating is the state of Wisconsin needs to certify its votes, which would take until December 1st before that recount can take place. Um, what I will say is there have been two recounts in recent years in the state of Wisconsin in statewide races. One showed a movement of 131 votes. The other showed a movement of about 300 votes. Uh, Biden maintains a very small lead, less than 1%, but it's about 20,000 votes. So that's not to say that the outcome could not be overturned, but it is there, but there's not historical precedent for it in that state. Um, but if the Trump campaign does decide to pursue the recount, then we will either be waiting until December or Biden will need to turn either Pennsylvania or Georgia in his favor in order to win uh, 270 electoral votes without the state of Wisconsin. Carson, what about you? What's standing out for you right now at the current status of the presidential race? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, as both Dan and Mar uh, uh, Marisa, Mar Marisa, Marisa, correct Marisa. me, Marisa. Marisa, thank you. Um, I, I mentioned, you know, it, it does hinge a lot on kind of this the the blue wall, the the Rust Belt uh, blue wall, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. Um, just note that you know in 2016 Trump uh, carried Wisconsin by a little over 20,000 votes, and so we're seeing kind of the the reverse here with Biden carrying it by that 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 kind of similar um, vote margin. Um, and so, is it likely to change in a recount situation if the Trump campaign decides to to, to do so? Probably not. So that's good news for the Biden campaign. Um, but what, what, when I'm kind of looking at the map, what what really stuck out to me is the importance of trying to expand the map as much as you possibly can. And the Biden campaign was able to do so in places like Arizona, the Southwest, where that um, Arizona's uh, electoral college votes is giving him the, the buffer, the pathway that he needs that uh, doesn't require Pennsylvania, which is trending positively for Biden, but maybe it might not be enough, uh, the outstanding votes in Philadelphia area in, in Allegheny County and other Democratic strongholds in Pennsylvania might not be enough for uh, Biden to really pull that state off. He doesn't need it because he was able to expand the map. Um, things are also looking good for Biden in Georgia, where uh, the Atlanta uh, metro and, and suburbs are have been trending Democratic, and the, the, that really remains where the outstanding vote is. Is it enough again for Georgia to flip um, to, uh, to the to the Biden column? Um, maybe, maybe not. I, I think I would much rather be on the Trump side uh, right now with the way things are going. But still, it speaks to this expanding of the map, so that if things went down like they did in Florida, if things uh, you know continue to trend like they are in Pennsylvania. That's still a, a, a okay situation for uh, for the Biden campaign and for a potential Biden presidency. Now, Dan, I mentioned in the intro uh, your founding of the uh, USCLA Times statewide poll. Um, there's going to be a lot of talking about poll misses again after this election. And last night, so what I've been seeing a lot of uh, professional pollsters say leading up to this election day was that um, in a lot of these states, states that ended up being, you know, razor thin one way or the other, but in a lot of those, Biden had a lead, for example, that was not just larger than Hillary Clinton's, but larger than the expected possible poll failure. And it's still, they managed to miss on a number of these things. Um, so without expecting you to explain every poll failure, but I mean, are, is... You, because you understand this maybe more than, than uh, most of our listeners, watchers, what do you think is maybe going on here? And are Americans becoming more and more difficult to model as we get more diverse and, and coalitions shift and change? Or um, is polling doomed? Well, I think we need to resist the temptation to 
paraphrase Shakespeare and say, let's kill all the pollsters. <laughs> and I realize that that would be a, that is a temptation in many quarters right now. What I will say is this, is some years ago, the Gallup poll, probably the gold standard of public opinion research in this country, came to a considered decision. They decided they were no longer going to do horse race polling. They were never going to ask any more about Trump versus Biden or you know, Bruno versus Lagos or candidate A versus B, but rather to survey voter attitudes, voter priorities, voter preferences on issues, on policy, and their assessments of the candidates as opposed to matching them against each other. And the reason Gallup did that is because uh, public opinion polling is not designed to be predictive. The cliche, which I know everyone who participates in a program like this has heard many times, is a poll is designed to be a snapshot in time at the moment that I ask a voter how he or she intends to vote. The real value in polling, and this is something, John, you and I have talked about with this audience before, the smart way to read a poll is not to try to predict an outcome that's months or weeks or even days away, but rather look at it as for insights on what the voters are thinking and why they're thinking what they're thinking. And because we as human beings and the media as media, no offense, Marisa, is just congenitally incapable of not extrapolating that into predictions. What Gallup decided to do is if our polls are going to be used as predictions, no matter what we do, we're going to simply stop polling horse races. And I wonder if Gallup's decision isn't a smart one going forward. It's let's use public opinion research for what it's designed for, to find out why voters are thinking what they are. Why are Cuban American voters and Nicaraguan American voters in Florida thinking certain things? Why are women in the suburbs of Phoenix thinking other things? And learn from that. And that way we'll no longer have to resist the temptation to say, oh, candidate A is 2.6 points ahead of his opponent and he was 3.1 points ahead last week and in, in, in reading too much into that. I know that sounds like a very long and strident rationalization, but I no longer run the Times SC poll, so I'm <laughs> off the anyway. Okay. Marisa, of the, when you were following things last night and, and overnight and this morning, what surprised you about any results? I mean, when you, you just look at the general map, things are kind of falling in the way they you kind of generally would expect them to do red state, blue state. But like uh, 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 Dan just mentioned, you know, people were kind of looking at at the breakdown of Hispanic vote in Florida and, and, and African-American men and such like that. When you were following this, what stands out to you as, as a surprise? I don't know if I'd call it a surprise because the polls were right in this, but um, I do think, you know, Democrats today are kind of... <laughs> being Democrats, right? Like they might win the White House, but they're licking their wounds because it wasn't a landslide. And I do think, and Carson kind of alluded to this, that we have to look at the broader trends here. I mean, Arizona flipping to blue, this is only the second time since Truman that Democrats won that state, um, assuming they hold it, which, I, you know, it's been called, it looks relatively likely. Um, Mark Kelly flipped uh, Martha McSally's seat there, John McCain's old seat. I mean, the Southwest has is changing. And I do think that even though both Texas and Florida ended up in the Republican column, there's some real, um, there are warning signs there for the GOP, maybe not as strong as some people had predicted coming into Tuesday. Um, and I think we're still waiting to see kind of how some of the legislative races play out to give us a more kind of micro perspective on this. But, you know, <sighs> nothing really surprises me. I think, I, I guess, maybe the Senate. I mean, it's definitely the fact that Susan Collins just held on to Maine, um, narrowing the path for Democrats, I think is uh, is is not, is, is less in line. In a way, like, that's more surprising than where the presidential race is. Because if you kind of step back and <sighs> don't think about the rhetoric of the past few weeks, this is a race that's been like where it's at on the national popular vote since January, since before coronavirus. Like it has been like 50, 48. I mean, I guess Trump's come up in some of those numbers, you know, which is pretty natural. So I don't know. I think that um, it, it's it's always bizarre covering this from San Francisco, like the cognitive dissonance to step back a little bit and just look at the difference between what voters did here and kind of what they did statewide and then nationally um, is a good reminder for me, like to Dan's point about pollsters, like I think 
those of us in the media have to, you know, remember where we sit and that we're in bubbles too. And that this year was even more challenging than normal because of COVID and the fact that we couldn't be on the ground. I mean, I thought I'd be in Arizona reporting out there. Instead, I'm doing like Zoom phone calls with folks. So um, it, it's hard to gauge what's happening on the ground when you can't actually be on the ground. Yeah. Carson. Yeah, I, I, and I kind of want to just piggyback on, onto that because, you know, when you look at how the two presidential campaigns at least operated, the Trump campaign operated in a much more traditional sort of manner. Um, boots on the ground, rallies, as if kind of uh, n- nothing was happening in regards to the pandemic. Whereas the Biden campaign went a much more kind of public health appropriate sort of route in doing more phone calls, more texting, more digital sort of outreach, less knocking on doors, fewer rallies when there were rallies. Um, there are more kind of car-based rallies or kind of um, digital rallies that were occurring. And so, I, you know, I think when we when the dust settles after all of this and when, uh, you know, the autopsy reports really start to take a look, there's obviously going to be a deep autopsy in Miami-Dade County to really kind of figure out um, kind of what happened there, uh, particularly around the various demographics um, that really kind of close that that uh, that margin gap uh, for Biden relative to Clinton and some other Democrats, uh, Democratic candidates in the past. Um, but then also kind of this, this kind of uniqueness of what has been a national election in the era of COVID. Um, with all the complications around uh, early vote, mail-in voting, uh, accounting, changing of rules, changing of laws, kind of quickly to kind of try to address with um, that. And then also how the campaigns reacted to just the the mechanics of the campaign itself. And I, and I think that does filter down then also to the Senate races um, that were competitive as well. Can I say one thing, John? I, sure. I, I think it's important to note, like, you know, obviously we're going to you know, give USC and all the public opinion pollers crap. But from what I understand from talking to folks in the Biden campaign, their internal polls were way off in states like Florida and, um, you know, even Texas, I think. So maybe not way off in Texas, but Florida, I think, really stands out. I mean, I think they their internal polls latest had them up by several percentage points there. So this is a bigger question, and, it, and, it, and I think it's going to speak to um, – just the Democratic Party's ability. I mean, I think that there's been this sense that as the country gets more diverse and, and, and more black and brown, that it's sort of automatically a win for Democrats. And obviously, I mean, white men in particular are the biggest supporters of President Trump. But I think Democrats are going to be forced to not take some things for granted that I think they have been. And certainly there's been this assumption, I think, on a lot of folks, a lot of uh, politicos, at least, that when they're looking at the Hispanic vote, they're talking about some monolithic vote and we're seeing it's very diverse. It's huge, of course, and very diverse. Well, I want to use this as a segue to get into congressional and Senate races uh, in the, in the U S Congress, someone in the audience uh, kind of gave us a good uh, question to start off with. And that is what happened with Sally, uh, uh, Martha McSally in, in uh, her race against, um, I believe Mark Kelly. It looks like he's pulled off a victory there. Um, Anyone want to jump in with that? Uh, I'll go ahead. Um, Yeah, I mean, just that, you know, I think Mark Kelly was a strong candidate. I think the Giffords have, um, you know, Gabby Giffords' name has a lot of sway there. I think he ran a smart campaign. um, And that, you know, Arizona is changing. And Democrats have done a lot of work there. I mean, I did a story just this week about how many Californians were kind of flooding the zone to try to flip it. I think that's a place where they've been successful in looking at the changing demographics and really tapping in to those changes, especially in Maricopa County. I mean, let's not forget, you know, 10 years ago, Sheriff Arpaio was in charge there and it was a very different reality. Um, And I think that there's some questions over what, you know, that era of Arizona politics did. You know, are are we seeing, I think it's too early to tell if uh, Senate Bill 1070, that check your papers thing was sort of their version of Prop 187, which really was sort of the beginning of the end of Republican domination in California. But I think... um, yeah, and, and I, you know, and I don't think McSally, quite frankly, was the strongest candidate. I mean, let's be clear. She lost to Kristen Cinema, who flipped that other Senate seat blue. She was appointed to John McCain's seat. Um, Cindy McCain supported Biden. I think that, you know, Arizona, and, uh, there's, there's a lot of independence there. And I think that even people who are partisan, you know, registered partisan, um, you know, they're, they're the home of the McCains. It's, there's, there's that maverick streak. And I think you see that with, uh, with that Senate race. 
John, yeah. if I can offer just two thoughts, one to follow up on Marisa's smart analysis on Arizona, but also to talk about the broader congressional outcomes. So think of it this way in Arizona. Phoenix is the world's largest suburb. Um, yeah, they used to say years and years ago that Los Angeles was 20 small towns looking for a city. <laughs> Phoenix is a hundred suburbs looking for an urban core. And as we've seen the suburban vote shift across the country from right to left, and for those of you with long enough memories, you can remember the term soccer moms being banded around in the late 20th century. So this has been a trend long and long in coming. Um, Arizona's switch from, from, from red to blue is a reflection of that broader uh, suburban shift. Uh, more broadly, as I think most of your most of our audience knows, um, at this point, it looks very unlikely uh, that the Democrats will be able to retake the control of the Senate. Uh, Sarah Gideon, the candidate, the Democratic candidate in Maine, conceded just a short while ago. At this point, Democrats need to hope that David Perdue, the incumbent senator in Georgia, the incumbent Republican, does not attain 50% of the vote and therefore goes to a runoff against his opponent, John Ossoff. He's a little bit over 50%. But toward Carson's point earlier, uh, the votes still to be counted in Georgia are in heavily Democratic areas. And so if, if Ossoff is able to keep uh, Purdue under 50%, then Georgia will have not one but two runoff elections in the first week in January. And the Democrats would have to win both of those in order to achieve a 50-50 split in the Senate which means that Vice President Kamala Harris, should she attain that position, would actually end up spending more time in the Senate as Vice President than she did as a United States Senator. And I don't say that to criticize her, but just to talk about what the Senate would be like under a 50-50 division. It appears that Democrats will um, not achieve nearly the gains that they had thought would be coming their way in the House. There's still so many races yet to be called, but if Democrats... Uh, hold their own, as opposed to losing seats at this point, that would be considered a victory. All of which means that if Joe Biden does become president, he will be the first president since George H.W. Bush in 1989 to come into office with a Congress controlled by the other party. And as George H.W. Bush's advisors would tell you, being a new president with a party, uh, Congress controlled by the other party is a very, very difficult way to govern. Carson, your thoughts on uh, particularly significant Senate races? Yeah, you know, it's it's um, in terms of the Senate, you know, it, it is surprising just the the let's call it what it is the failures of the, a lot of the the Democratic challengers um, across the board in, in those competitive states. Um, the, again, going back to the polling, a lot of them were showing the the Senate candidates uh, running slightly ahead of uh, Joe Biden in many of these states, and and the Republican incumbent running a little bit behind Trump in a lot of those states. So um, again, it's another polling um, off in terms of the horse race polls. Um, but then also you kind of look at places like Michigan where it's trending well for the incumbent Gary Peters there. Uh, but, you know, right before we, we signed on, the Republican challenger, John James, James um, was still, I believe, a little bit ahead. And so that's a seat that, the, you know, the Democrats need to hold on to in order to really kind of get to that Senate majority. Um, one that, while showed signs of competitiveness, wasn't really showing signs of uh, re really lit, kind of red, you know, red alert alarms sort of competitiveness for the Democrats. So there, there are some surprises there, but it, it, I think uh, to, to kind of um, both Dan and to Marisa's point, um, the suburbs, you know, it, it's we're, we're kind of coming down to this kind of tale about um, the suburbs kind of trending more toward kind of the how the urban uh, areas are voting now, obviously not to the, to the degree of the margins, whereas the rural areas are definitely trying to tre trending um, more to be kind of a counterbalance to the urban uh, margins the Democrats get. And so if we're looking at these communities, these states, uh, where the demographic, demographic changes and, and voting pattern changes are really being driven by the suburbs, Arizona being a classic case right now, but Georgia also being one that seems to be trending in that direction. You know, Texas, even though it didn't really kind of end up in, in on the blue kind of column side this time, um, it, 
the, the, the trends and the, the margin is not a place where I would be a, a, a uh, on the Republican side kind of really celebrating uh, because those trends are really sh showing signs of some concern for Republicans in a state like Texas. So it kind of reminds me back when you think about the kind of the, 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 the emerging Democratic majority um, narrative uh, from earlier in the, uh, the 2000s where there was a lot of talk about the changing demographics of the Democratic uh, of voters in general and, and that benefiting the, the Democrats and that being really focused on kind of racial trends and eth uh, ethnicity trends. Um, and it might actually be kind of this unique case where we should be actually looking at kind of the college educated versus non-college educated trends more so than maybe even um, the racial ethnicity trends. Um, again, it's I think there's gonna be a lot of autopsies, a lot of kind of trying to figure out what happened and, and whether this is a sticking uh, trend or whether this is just kind of an anomaly given the, the, the uniqueness of COVID, uniqueness of um, Trump's personality, uniqueness of Joe Biden's um, just uh, uh, profile and, and image that uh, was kind of hard to penetrate and kind of hard to kind of bog down for, for Republicans. But um, there's a lot, I think, to unpack here across the presidential as well as the congressional sides. Marisa, when uh, the, I guess the current Congress was was getting organized, uh, uh, House House Speaker Nancy Pelosi basically agreed to uh, two terms if she you know gets it for uh, to be Speaker. Um, a, do you think she will stick to that? And B, do you think she should? Um, yeah, I mean, that gives her another two years, right, as right, speaker. Right. And I think, um, you know, never say never. I'm sure given, I guess, I just, it is, it is sort of funny. I mean, let's think back to 2016. Biden hasn't won yet, but if he does, if the scenario we laid out happens, Democrats are sitting here, like, wringing their hands. Um, you know, Trump lost the popular vote and, and, uh, had a mandate in his mind. So like some of this is just like the difference between the parties and like how they would seem to like approach things. I think Democrats are just warriors. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, look, Pelosi has had a lot of obviously criticism. She's the most, you know, hated woman in, in, in red States and is usually used um, not always to great effect by Republicans to sort of paint Democrats with this progressive, you know, San Francisco values thing. The truth is, though, she's a masterful legislative leader. I mean, that is her strength. She's not great at giving press conferences, um, although she's gotten pretty good at trolling Trump, I would say, in some of those news conferences. But generally, you know, her strength is behind the scenes. It's in counting votes. It's in keeping coalitions together. She has made a lot of concessions um, to the left progressive wing of the party in terms of bringing, you know, newer members, uh, less senior members into positions of more power within committee structures. Um, I think what we will see, I mean, unless something dramatic happens and um, there's a you know, a really good challenge to her, what I think is more likely is that we see a sort of slow um you know, change in, in the way, like, like, I think we'll have a better sense next year who she is grooming to take over in some of these key positions. Um, and, you know, I think the speakership itself will be a fight in 2022 or 23, I guess. But um, I, I don't, I don't expect her to renege on that. And I don't expect at this point, I've heard nothing about an actual challenge uh, to her leadership for this next term. Uh yeah, I guess. Disagree. Um, oh, yeah, I, ahead, I, 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 I totally agree. I think it's very unlikely she would face a challenge. I think for all the finger pointing and blame laying that you will inevitably see among Democrats, um, I don't think a, a huge amount will be target focused in her direction. And that that is, I think, will be relatively subdued, just given the lack of an alternative. And I say that is no disrespect to the other members of the Democratic leadership. But it's worth noting that the, the, the Democratic congressional leadership is a little bit like France right after World War II. You have a very old generation and a very young generation in that entire middle generation that just got wiped out in the war. And if you think about it, that next generation of leaders that was grooming themselves to step in in the aftermath of the Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, James Clyburn generation, they're all gone. Rahm Emanuel, Javier Becerra, Mm -hmm. they all got tired of waiting and moved on to other things. 
And so the types of people who are being talked about as the next speaker now, people like Hakeem Jeffries, uh, with the possible exception of Adam Schiff uh, from Southern California, um, most of the really rising stars in the Democratic House caucus would probably benefit from another couple of years of a Pelosi speakership, not just for the sake of the party and the caucus, but for their own professional and political development. Carson, any last comments before we move on? Yeah, just on the kind of the House side, and, and especially with P- Speaker Pelosi, you know, the, the uh, it, it does look like she's going to go into the next Congress with a, a reduced majority, but um, the the seats that she's kind of that she's lost there, or or maybe could potentially lose because there are you know a few seats that are still quite competitive in California, but still many 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 votes left to count in California. Um, none of these are surprises. These these were these were hard districts that kind of surprised um, you know the, the pundits and procrastinators in 2018 that they flipped the way that they did to the Democratic side. Um, and so the fact that these are competitive or maybe flipping back to the Republican column, um, it, it's not a, 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 I think, an indictment of her leadership within that caucus itself. So the fact of the matter is she continues to be in a position that um, she has always really been in, in a very strong one uh, for the caucus. And um, and I think the, the Democratic just, you know, operation in general um, appreciates having someone as well seasoned there. Um, to be at the negotiating table, whether it's a Biden presidency or a Trump presidency. She played a big, big role during the Obama years, um, really either pushing uh, the Obama White House in certain directions or or, pull, or pulling it in other directions. Um, and so uh, I think a lot of folks see her importance there, regardless of kind of who's sitting in the White House, and, and particularly it adds a counterbalance to uh, the U.S. Senate side, too. Very good. We've got a question that that touches the right on the next section I want to get into, which is the state ballot propositions, ballot measures. And uh, they ask, uh, given the kind of the mixed uh, results we're seeing and, and some passing, some failing and trying to parse, you know, what, what are what is the electorate here thinking is kind of wondering if California might be moderating a bit. So let, let's get into some of the significant uh, propositions and, and see what you think. Um, uh Maybe just start with, there was an effort with Proposition 15 to change the commercial property tax. Uh, anyone want to tackle that? Tell us what's going on with it and uh, what you think is happening. What are the voters saying? Well, it definitely, uh, I, I, I'll jump in here on this one, because it definitely seems, you know, this is a amending in a, um, in a quote unquote negative way, the the Prop 13. So it's not kind of expanding Prop 13's um, rules or protections or you know systems. It's it's trying to pull you know pull things back from Prop 13. And for the longest time, <clears throat> Prop 13 has been called the third rail of California politics, and for a very good reason. Um, Democrats have historically avoided trying to touch it or or kind of go after it or criticize it. Uh, Republicans. Uh, up and down the ballot have been running as champions and protectors of it. And, and that's, uh, you know, in many ways helped to kind of head off some of the more anti-Republican headwinds um, in, in many places for uh, for the Republican Party here in California. And so the fact of the matter is it started off, Prop, Prop 15 started off with a heavy, very steep hill ahead of it to climb. And they would need to really have made a, a, a strong campaign really kind of counterbalancing the, the, the very pro prop 13 nature of California in general. And when you look at expenditures, basically the yes, no side were at a wash 56 million, 57 million as of the last um, uh, filing versus uh, for the, the, the support side. Uh, 54 million for the, the the no side, and so it doesn't seem like the Prop 15 campaign was really able to get that at, at that advantage, that upper edge, uh, to really kind of make their case um, in the reason why you needed to kind of roll back parts of Proposition 13. And we're seeing the state kind of um, fall in line with kind of the the notion of Prop 13 just shouldn't be touched right now. Yeah, Dan, I'm I'm seeing Prop 15 currently losing. Uh, 51.7 no percent no vote. Um, does that surprise you for that for that uh, proposition? Well, it, it is worth noting that we'll be they'll be counting ballots for another 16 days. Uh, so that one is is, is far from over. Um, I'd, I'd offer two thoughts, John. One, ballot initiatives don't pass in California. 
They just don't. At least they don't pass when there's money spent against them. Um, Proposition 8, you know, back a decade or so ago, which uh, would have outlawed same-sex marriage in California, passed although it was outspent. Uh, before that, I think you have to go back to 1988, to Proposition 103, the insurance initiative. And before that, probably to Prop 13 itself. So when there's a decent amount of money spent against an initiative, it just generally doesn't win. And it takes a disproportionate spending advantage like we saw in Prop 22, the gig economy initiative, for anything to pass. Um, I, I don't think California is moderating, John. I, f- I think that it's gone from purple to blue to indigo over the last couple of decades. And so I think we're still seeing a, a state that's moving significantly leftward. It's worth noting that the, the Proposition 20, which would have reinstated some of the criminal justice penalties uh, um, on nonviolent uh, offenders, was defeated by an overwhelming margin. Um, and in fact, I'll take what I suspect is going to be a somewhat contrarian opinion on Proposition 16, which would have involved the restoration of affirmative action in California. My own opinion is that Prop 16 did not lose because it was too progressive. It lost because it was not progressive enough. Let me explain for just a minute. The number of young people who are applying to college every year in a state of 40 million people is a relatively small number. The number of individuals who are applying for government contracts in California is an even smaller number. If you think back to all those people who marched, who demonstrated, who protested last spring and summer on behalf of social and racial justice, I wonder if they might not have seen Prop 16 as pretty small potatoes. In other words, what they were demonstrating for was something much bigger and much broader and something more seminal. And I wonder if Prop 16 was just dismissed as an irrelevancy to many of those people who might have uh, uh, supported a broader and more far-reaching social justice or racial justice initiative. Marisa, weigh in on these props. I like that reading, Dan. I don't know if I agree with it. I think I just think affirmative action is one of those things that has a lot of baggage attached to the actual like language. And I think the yes side, while they had more far more money in an actual campaign, um, I mean. Did you all hear their messaging? Like, I mean, I, I gotta say, like, I feel like Prop 22 is really the only one I heard a lot about personally in my just like everyday life when it came to ads and mailers and things like that. Um, dialysis. And I'm sorry. Dialysis. Dialysis. <laughs> God, I don't even want to talk about that. Um, <laughs> but you know, I think that. I think Dan's right in one sense. I mean, I, my husband and I had a really interesting conversation about this after our, uh, you know. 13 year old niece said something to her dad about opposing this because, um, you know, essentially just the, like this idea that in her mind as a young person that like white people shouldn't get special treatment and that this would almost flip that. Like, I just think a lot of people like this, this brings up a lot of really interesting sort of deep seated concerns people have. Um, and I don't know that the pro side on that one did a good job of explaining what they saw as its connection to Black Lives Matter and this racial justice movement. And, and I think for, for, you know, voters who are around for Prop 209, um, that it, it, it had a different kind of meaning um, than for folks maybe who were not voting at that time. I mean, broadly, I think Dan's right. Look, it's way easier to convince people to vote now and money talks. If you look at, I mean, even Prop 15, I mean, we're all thinking about how this was supported by the Democratic establishment and all the labor unions, but business still outspent them 74 and a half million to 67.9 million. And obviously that's a decent match, but if you're starting from a place where Prop 13 is so closely guarded by the more reliable voters who are older homeowners um, and where, you know, there's a lot of confusion over what this would actually do, which was, I think, successfully uh, sort of sowed by the opposition, that this could go further than what proponents thought and that it could impact apartment buildings or farms. You know, I just think that people, when they have a doubt, do vote no. I think they were probably, the no side was probably 
um, helped by the fact that we are in this pandemic and that people are a little gun shy about tax increases um, in a moment of recession. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I think if you look broadly, like, yeah, just I think it, with the exception of probably Prop uh, 16, money tends to talk in these races. And um, I mean, one thing I'm I'm looking into um, right now or, or doing some analysis on is, is what this election says about criminal justice reform in California. Um, I think, you know, yes, again, like Prop 20 is a good example of both what I said, which is it's easier to convince people to vote no and money talks. I also think, though, if you look at the margin on that one, it's pretty decisive. And I think that that tells me voters, that along with the fact that I think you know, six Bay Area counties passed police accountability measures. George Gascon looks like he's going to win the DA race in LA, the progressive challenger to the Democratic uh, incumbent there. Um, I don't think we can look at this election and say California voters think that criminal justice reforms have gone too far. I think what we're seeing is that they're willing to go further in many cases than the legislature has been. Um, and if we want to, we can talk about bail, which I think is kind of an a separate issue um, around that debate. But it, I think, you know, setting aside the national results for the lefty progressives who have been pushing for decades to really change the dynamic here around criminal justice, I think they had a very good night this week. And uh, Dan, and then I want to talk, Carson, there's some housing stuff on the, on the props that I want to yeah, get into yeah. with you. But, but first, Dan. Just one other thing on the initiatives, John, on all of them, or at least on most of them, we pay a state legislature to go to Sacramento several days a week, all year long, to work on these issues for us. And the fact that we're being asked in a yes or no way to decide how to help disadvantaged young people succeed in college and beyond, the, the idea that we're being asked to decide these critical, intricate questions about consumer online privacy, the fact that we're supposed to become experts on dialysis machines is just an unconscionable abdication of their responsibility. Uh, I'm for the initiative process, as are most Californians. I think we reserve, need to reserve the right to step in when our legislature, our elected representatives can't or won't act. But look, legislation is a scalpel. A ballot initiative is a sledgehammer. And most, many of these issues are way too intricate to hit with, to hit with a hammer. Mm -hmm. And it really is unfortunate that our elected representatives in both parties we're not more willing to take on some of the more challenging issues here, leaving them to very busy, very stressed, and toward Maurice's point, voters who are paying attention to a lot of other things. It's only our job when they can't do theirs, and it's becoming our job much too frequently. It, it might be interesting if there were a higher hurdle to get to clear in order to get something on the ballot. I mean, 12 ballot measures, like you said, that we're supposed to, and I said this in a previous week to week, where I am utterly unqualified to vote on dialysis centers. I, you know, it's not that I, I'm unconcerned about the topic. It sounds very important. I, my knowledge is nowhere near it. I'm still trying to figure out oh, I, cash bail. Marisa. Yeah. I think it'll be interesting to see what the undervote is on some of those measures because I do think that there are voters who just go, I don't want, I don't know, I, I don't know, like, I, like really, I mean, seriously, I do this for a living and I cannot. That is one of those ones where I'm just like, every time someone wants to talk about it, I just kind of just, you know. Um, and I think the privacy one, I mean, I'm a little surprised that that is actually pulling, they're pulling that out because I, I thought that the confusion might have uh, muddied the waters for that, but again, money. Money and you know people like privacy. Carson, uh, Proposition Twenty, excuse me, uh, Twenty One on local government rent control, and I, I it at least the numbers I'm seeing with seventy two percent in, but uh, it's nearly sixty percent against it. Um, to be honest, my thinking kind of was in a year in which we've had, you know, basically a, a housing debacle in this state, uh, which is kind of our business as usual here, but you know what I mean with, with you know, delaying rent and then people expecting to pay all their rent, the, the, the accrued uh, uh, pay, due rent and, and kind of what I think a lot of people are fearing is an, a looming eviction uh, 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 catastrophe or whatever. I kind of expected that proposition to do better. What are your thoughts on that one and, and uh, any other housing uh, stuff on this ballot. 
Yeah. Yeah. But before I jump to that, I just want to you know, piggyback on kind of what Dan was saying with that, you know, the, the, the proposition system is popular here in California, but at the same time, Californians also recognize that the, the propositions are just way too complex. Um, and there is luckily, especially given the rigidity of our proposition system, where only really the only way to amend or repeal a proposition is with another proposition, um, that the, the default is to vote no. You have to be convinced to kind of pull the, the, the yes lever. And on many of these cases, um, you know, Proposition 19, another kind of Prop 13 uh, related one, but also housing related one, you had that one that kind of was, could be considered a good and a bad, depending on what side of the aisle you sit on, you know, whether you sit on a conservative or liberal leaning side, um, kind of nested within this, the exact same proposition. Um, and so you're kind of sitting there thinking, well, I like this portion, but I don't like this portion. What do you end up doing? Luckily, it seems like people kind of uh, either don't vote on it or um, choose, the, choose the no side. But to, to your question uh, on Proposition 21, you know, this is one of those frustrating things about the proposition system. And, you know, the it's sometimes called the citizens initiative. Well, I'm sorry, no citizen is really kind of putting these ballot uh, measures on um, the ballot anymore. Um, these are special interests either to uh, benefit um, their industry or, the, or their, their business or their, their, their side, or it's pet projects of really wealthy individuals um, who want to kind of circumvent the legislative process to kind of get their pet project or pet issue um, in front of the voters. Proposition 21 is an excellent example of that. It's basically bankrolled by one individual and one organization that actually has nothing, that organization has nothing to do with um, renters rights or even housing policy in, in general. Um, that was attempted two years ago with Proposition 10 um, that went down in flames, uh, 41 yes, uh, 50, 59 no, uh, to just two years ago. The legislature then went through the process of actually kind of expanding rent control laws statewide. Um, and then yet the same proponent uh, tries to kind of do the, the, the same thing with amending of Costa Hawkins, the, the statewide rent control um, uh, piece of legislation uh, on this ballot. Um, and we're seeing a very, very simil similar margin. Um, and I, I don't anticipate um, the margin really changing that much. And we'll probably end up around 40% yes, 60% no again. Um, and so it's just like, you know, to, to Dan points, just let the legislature do its job. If you don't like what the legislature is doing, then focus on legislative seats and change the composition there or go through the process there. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's designed to do what it does and it does, it, it does do it. It just takes time to do it. Um, let Californians be Californians and live their lives. Can I say too, like John, I think Very we always have this conversation like, oh, should it be harder? Why are we voting on so much stuff? But the bottom line is to Carson's point, if we made it harder, it would only make it more likely that the only stuff we're voting on is like the Prop 22s of the world, where you have an industry willing to spend $200 million mm -hmm. to essentially carve out something, an exception to state law that lawmakers pass. Let's not forget, AB5 only took effect this year. They didn't like it, so they went to the voters and convinced them that they should get a, a, essentially a special exception. I think that, you know, bail is the same. People are saying, why am I voting on this? Well, because it's a referendum and the bail industry put it on because they didn't want to lose their business. Um, so ironically, like I think making it harder would only make the moneyed interest kind of a stronger, um, uh, be in a stronger position. And, you know, arguably that's sort of less democratic. Um, but yeah, I think, I, I do think that some of the things we also have to like look in the mirror and remember that the reason we're voting on many of these measures, including Prop 15, including Prop 20, is because we voted them in in the first place. And so in order to change an initiative, we got to go back and vote on it. And um, in some cases, like Prop 13, that's just, you know, a 40 year reality. Um, in the case of criminal justice reform, it's because reform advocates got sick of waiting for lawmakers to like, you know, well, I was going to say something probably not appropriate, but, you know, lawmakers have not historically been willing to go out on a limb and vote for criminal justice reform. They don't want the Willie Horton situation happening. And so what happened was advocates had to go to voters directly. And I think what will be interesting to see on that issue is whether the legislature is more willing to go further because, you know, Prop 20, I think, was such a strong indication that voters and all the local measures on police accountability in the Bay Area, a half dozen, all passing 
you know, very strongly the one in Oakland, like 80%, it was leading by last night. Um, that tells me that this whole racial reckoning we're having a, a at least in California, um, that the electorate is actually willing to go further than a lot of our elected representatives are. Okay, um, and unrelated but related, the voters of Mississippi appear to have voted to uh, confirm the removal of the Confederate battle flag image emblem from their state flag. So, well, let's talk about what? some state races that are that involve actual candidates and not propositions, um, and. There were there were a couple uh, large city mayoral races. I think Sacramento. Am I correct? Uh, I might be wrong in that. Um, but San Diego, yes. Um, <laughs> San Diego, yes. <laughs> I read something about Sacramento before this. So, <laughs> so any city that starts with an S, uh, uh, Carson, can you talk about it? Yeah, well, San Diego uh, duh, is electing their new mayor, of course, Kevin Falconer, um, even though the mayor is a nonpartisan race, Kevin Falconer being uh, a well-known uh, Republican has held that position um, and it's termed out. Uh, and so um, the Republicans actually got uh, blocked out of uh, that race. The, the, the No one reached uh, 50% um, in the, uh, in the primary. And so, um, the, the top two vote getters moved on and that was Tom, Todd Gloria, who a long time city, um, city level of official had actually served briefly as the, um, interim mayor, uh, when, um, uh, when they're going through their Bob Filner debacle and with, uh, when, when the he, Bob, uh, Filner had to re resign as mayor and before Kevin Falconer be, uh, was, was re elected in that special election. And then against Barbara Bry, who, uh, again, a, a previous city council uh, member. And um, it looked like, at least from my perch here in Los Angeles, not really being on the ground there in, in San Diego, it definitely looked like the kind of the, the battle lines were really kind of uh, the the broader kind of NIMBY versus YIMBY battle lines that we're seeing in a lot of different races. Um, also one in San Francisco with Scott Wiener against his progressive, progressive uh, challenger. Um, and because when you look at the, the, the issue, both Todd Glory and, and Barbara Bry are, are, um, are Democrats and, and a lot of many of the issues they agree, uh, but on the one that they really, um, uh, differed and where you really saw them kind of leaning into and trying to build kind of a coalition for, of voters was around this concept of development, housing, uh, transportation, uh, with Barbara Bry really leaning more into the kind of the suburban car, uh, car friendly voters, um, single family house kind of type voters. Um, that have really kind of become this kind of nexus point around the NIMBYism in the state uh, and Todd Gloria really thinking more about um, kind of the more YIMBY movement of uh, mixed use housing and development of kind of fewer reliance on uh, single use vehicles uh, moving for forward. So at this point in time, again, early, a lot of votes still to be counted. Uh, Todd Gloria does look like um, he's the favorite to kind of um, start shepherding the, the city of San Diego uh, forward, California's uh, third largest city, right? That's Second. my hometown too. Um, yeah. I, uh, I think it's really fascinating to see over my lifetime how much that city has changed. I mean, it was really such a strong military presence, um, a much more, you know, re reliable Republican or at least conservative leaning place in the 80s and 90s. And, um, you know, we've seen this happen with some of the congressional seats down there as well. Um, thinking of Daryl Issa's old seat, although, you know, he picked up his bag and went to Eastern San Diego County and he is winning, although that congressional race is a lot closer than we would have guessed a year ago. Oh, really? Um, but yeah, Barbara Breeze lost. I mean, she definitely ran as a more conservative Democrat. And I think that um, the I'm pretty sure the entire board of supervisors, the Democratic slate has won. I don't know if all those races have been called, but they were all winning, like leading in early returns. Um, and I think it just speaks to this real, you know, serious divide we see between the coastal cities and the those indigo blue areas Dan's talking about and 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 you know, more inland areas that do sort of, I think, reflect more of that um, rural urban divide we're seeing just nationally in politics. And if you do look at that urban rural divide that Marisa mentions nationally, it's worth noting that when Faulkner leaves office, um, he was the only Republican mayor of one of the 10 largest cities in America. John, I don't know if you still do your trivia questions with presence for the audience, but if you did, quick question, and no one can Google it, 
at what will now be the largest city in America with a Republican mayor? The answer is Jacksonville, Florida. Wow. Just so you know. How big is that? It's the 12th largest city in the country. Still pretty big, but still. And after that comes like Oklahoma City or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that I've watched that as well as I've occasionally checked in on, on cities and was like, wait, oh, Indianapolis, completely Democrat run last time I saw it. When I lived there 27 years ago, moderate Republican, you know, pretty much across the board. Um, and and they're the to go back to Wisconsin because everything's really about Wisconsin again. Um, Charlie Sykes, uh, uh, a longtime conservative uh, commentator and, and, and political expert there, has noted um, that what they've seen this shift there where the blue s- parts of the state, you know, the big cities, Milwaukee, uh, Madison, we'll call Green Bay a big city, but still the urban areas have, have, of course, been trending bluer and the red states have been trending redder. But as you've seen the suburbs go purplish and, and now possibly bluish, um, there's no uh, equivalent expansion of the red uh, dominion, right? You know, it's the growing urban areas that are growing in people and in actual geographical parts of, of the space in the state. Um, so if, if I were looking at that, I'm looking at that bluish, blue word trend to continue, uh, maybe slowly and, and back and forth a bit, but um, the, you know, the, the, we're not increasingly building farms in, inside big cities and reclaiming them for agriculture and, and pickup trucks. I think the Nothing question here, go ahead, Carson. Yeah, I, I think to that point, John, is um, kind of what happens with the excerpts, you know, like that, that kind of that transition period to, you know, space, uh, from, you know, from the suburb that are, the suburbs are, at least here in California, are becoming more urbanized in many respects. And um, the, that, that trend will probably continue. But the excerpts are becoming very much more kind of like that uh, historical, vi- you know, version of the California suburb, um, you know, simple kind of just driving. And recently, uh, my partner and I were driving from uh, Palm Springs back to LA, and you really kind of go through this really rural area of Riverside County into the, that at the exurbs portion of Riverside San Bernardino before you really hit then you know, the San Gabriel uh, suburbs of, of Los Angeles. And um, you, you definitely kind of see you you feel and see that transition both in kind of the the way that people live their lives, but then also um, around politics and. Uh, you know, the, I think the question mark for a lot of folks here in California uh, about whether the Democrats can continue to expand their very strong majorities um, in the state legislature and, and in many respects, but then also as we kind of move outside of the state um, is kind of what happens with those excerpts. Do they start to trend more and act more like the rural parts of the, uh, of the, the states and regions or do they start acting a little bit more like the, the, the suburbs? Interesting. So I want to, we're pretty much out of, almost out of time, but I have kind of an exit topic that I, I just want to bring up. And this one, after all the, the hair pulling and, and stress of the last, and stress drinking probably of the last uh, 12, 15, 18 hours. Um, so assuming that Biden and Harris, that that ticket wins, that means Governor Gavin Newsom will appoint a replacement for the U.S. Senate for Kamala Harris's seat. So um, starting with you, Dan, any thoughts? Because if we know Gavin Newsom, he's got very well collated files with all of his 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 potential <laughs> uh, uh, appointees. Um, what, what do you think he's thinking? And who? Yeah, no, binders, binders of women. But uh, who do you think he might be? He might be choosing, and who do you think would be good to uh, choose? For that seat? I'll, I'll make you two predictions, John. Uh, the first is. Um, one of the following five people will be appointed to the Senate. It will either be Secretary of State Alex Padilla, Attorney General Javier Becerra, State Treasurer or Controller Fiona Ma or Betty Yee, or the Lieutenant Governor Alani Kalanlakis. And the reason for that is because the only thing better for Gavin Newsom than having one really big political chit is having two really big political chits. And by appointing a constitutional officer to the Senate, then he, Newsom, gets to fill that seat. There's a rumor that's just started floating around Washington the last couple of days that Sarah might be a potential candidate to be 
Attorney General in a Biden administration. If that's the case, then I would, and Fiona Ma has already made it clear she's not interested in the appointment she wants to run for governor. So I'd say Alex Padilla is probably the clear favorite at this point. Uh, but the Lieutenant Governor has a lot of very uh, 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 strong allies. So I keep an eye on her also. The other prediction I'd make is both for the Senate seat and for the vacated constitutional office, Gavin Newsom is about as likely to appoint a white man as I am to start a quarterback for the 49ers now that Jimmy Garofalo is injured. Um, I think uh, there's, and that's not to disparage any of the potential selections for either office. There is a huge number of very qualified women, members of communities of color, members of the LGBTQ community. Um, but I cannot imagine a circumstance under which Newsom would pick a fellow straight white male. Bad news for Adam Schiff and for Eric Garcetti. Marisa, your thoughts on Gavin's pick? Um, Gavin, Mr. Governor Newsom, excuse me. Well, we can call him Gavin. We've known him for a long time. Um, <laughs> you literally have. I have. <laughs> and I have seen his binders, believe me. Uh, yeah, I, and I think those names are all in the running. I, I would add Barbara Lee to that. I do think that there's going to be some pressure to pick a black woman. I mean, look, those the it, if it was a Diane Feinstein seat, and we can talk about whether that could happen, which is entirely possible in the coming years, although maybe less so now that Democrats may not take the Senate and they don't have to have that judiciary fight. Um, but I think, you know, given how few women are in the Senate, how few black people are in the Senate, I think that that is definitely a consideration. Um, and that, you know, all those people that Dan mentioned are folks that are, you know, pretty close to Gavin. Um, I, I do think it's interesting with Becerra, um, just on a personal note, I'm not sure he wants to go back to DC. He moved his family out here, his wife's practicing medicine, his parents, I know he's helping, you know, they're very close with, um, but you know, you don't turn down the attorney general job, I'm sure. So um, yeah, I think, uh, I think a woman is a better bet for this seat if, if they indeed win. Okay, and Carson. What do you think about Gavin Newsom? I, I'm not sure if I have really too much more to add to this. Um, I would say that I, I wouldn't discount uh, any of the Latino options, just given the uh, growing uh, just importance generally of Latinos in the state of California overall as a, as a, as a demographic. So that definitely uh, it helps out uh, Secretary Padilla, who I've heard has um, been really thinking and looking at the U.S. Senate for quite some time. Um, it also potentially helps out someone like Long Beach Mayor uh, Robert uh, Garcia, um, who's also part of the LGBTQ community, um, kind of provides uh, some SoCal representation in the U.S. Senate, particularly if Feinstein is sticking around, uh, given her San Francisco uh, connection. So we'll see. I think the, I think the big, big, big question, um, and uh, you know, I, I really like Dan's perspective of the constitutional officers because that does give him um, multiple ways to influence operations politically in the state. But I also think is you know, does he? I would go with a, a placeholder appointment, um, or does he does he put some you know his his thumb uh, on the scales and, and appoint someone who definitely plans and, and has a, a strong advantage uh, when it comes uh, to the uh, special election, which would come down just a few years later. And on that on that note, we will leave it. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, thank you for surviving this election. Uh, it's obviously going to continue to be a very closely watched topic for the next few days, weeks, hours. I'm sure we're all gonna be glued to our, our respective uh, news sources. So thank you to our great panel today, Marisa Lagos, Dan Schner, and Carson Bruno. Thanks to all of you for thank listening you, and watching online. Stay safe and stay healthy. Have a good week.